Hi, my name is Beth Walsh. I'm the horticulturist at Castle Hill in Ipswich, Massachusetts for the trustees. The trustees is a conservation organization that uh, manages and owns 118 properties throughout the Commonwealth. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the Rose Garden at Castle Hill. There have been two previous segments um, about the Rose Garden highlighting conservation in action by the trustees. And you can find those on the trustees YouTube channel if you're interested. The slide that you see in front of you is a historic view of the Rose Garden at Castle Hill. Um, it is a round garden. It was designed as a round garden by Arthur Shercliffe between 1913 and 1915. Uh, the ha it has a lower section that is planted with a circular bed um, with a fountain and a fountain jet in the center and then a raised walkway with a pergola overhead around three sides of the garden. The view that we see in this historic photo is headed east looking back towards the Italian garden and the great house at Castle Hill. The Rose Garden serves as a terminus of that um, axis of formal garden spaces and the side where our backs are to in this photo faces due west, making the Rose Garden a beautiful place to watch the sunset over Fox Creek and a very sort of romantic, sublime kind of space. Um, you heard probably, um, if you were able to catch the video, a bunch about the history and the importance of the Rose Garden by Cindy Brockway, and then about the construction that we're doing um, by Josh Hassenfuss in the previous videos. And today we're focusing on the planting plan, which I like to call the um, icing of the project. It's really what everybody sees and what people associate gardens with. Um, in the Rose Garden, we have some challenges for the planting um, in that we don't have historic plans. We don't know exactly what was there. What we do know was Arthur Shercliffe designed the space and the architecture and then um, hired Harriet Risley Foote, a well-known Rosarian uh, from Marblehead, to design the plantings. Um, what you see here in the photo is all roses. Um, we have some challenges in how to design our current plan to um, evoke this feeling that you see in the photo, this um, rose-filled sort of crazy space, um, utilizing fewer roses and um, a mixed planting that will fit better both with the space, with the current site conditions, and with our um, motivation for um, better conservation and stewardship of the land. So this second slide is showing the view on the left is what was there before um, the current plantings at the Rose Garden. So the space was empty for many, many years. It was closed off to the public. You could peer in through a gate um, and see how amazing it looked, how ruinous and you know wonderful, but you couldn't go in. Um, about four years ago, uh, we were able to open the space with some limited plantings and spring bulb displays and uh, really sort of generate some interest in what the garden could be. And it pretty quickly became um, one of the most popular garden spots at Castle Hill. Um, really showcasing um, how much people enjoyed sort of that, that feeling of end of the garden spaces, that, that terminus that was missing when the Rose Garden was closed. The view on the right is an illustrative drawing that is just showing the location and the size and the relation um, of the plantings that are going to be installed as part of this rejuvenation project. Um, one challenge that we've had is the um, side, if you're standing in the photo on the left, um, the side to your left is cut into the slope there and it is almost full shade. The um, portion on the right, here I can move my cursor, this side over here is full sun. And the way that the grading of the site um, the way that the garden sits into the site, this shady part on the left is cut into the slope. 
and this sunny part on the right stands way high on a retaining wall about 20 feet above the ground. So the conditions for sun and shade are quite different. Um, the conditions for moisture are quite different. This shady side stays nice and moist. Um, this sunny side bakes as if it's in the desert. Um, and so one of the challenges that we have in this planting design is how to make this garden feel like one cohesive space. How do people, um, or how are people going to be able to enter the garden and feel like they're in one unified garden space, not a shade garden to the left and a sun garden to the right. Um, that is um, a challenge for any designer. Um, and it has been really fun and really unique to, to try and puzzle that out over the last couple months. Um, so without further ado, the roses. You can see in that historic photo, the garden was really all about the roses. And they were able to have a garden that was all about the roses because the cranes were only here for a short period during the summer. Um, another thing that I have um, uncovered from a lot of research is that Harriet Risley Foote, the designer, really loved hybrid tea roses. And so hybrid teas are going to bloom throughout the season, but they also require the most pesticide, the most fertilizer, and the most care of any group of roses. The heirloom or antique roses um, are often um, a little easier to deal with, but they often bloom only once. And so um, we do know that uh, Mrs. Foote probably would have specified um, a lot of hybrid teas, uh, probably mixed with other roses. And because we don't know exactly what the planting plan was, I have turned to a book that she wrote. So uh, Mrs. Foote lived in Marblehead, and at one time she had over 2,000 roses in her garden. And uh, she wasn't growing the roses necessarily for a beautiful composition um, or to have a, a wonderfully laid out space. She was really interested in the best roses, hybridizing roses and new roses. And uh, she came up with a system in her book where she lists close to a thousand varieties of roses. And she recommends, those are her recommended varieties. And she lists them with one star, two stars, or no stars and little comments or quotes about how she feels about those particular roses. Um, so even though we don't have the plan, we do have a, a substantial amount of information about what Mrs. Foote may have been using or liked to use in rose gardens. And um, we can select some of the best varieties that will fit in our space and um, use that to incorporate the historic aspect, which is so important at Castle Hill, um, with our modern use for the garden. Um, and here you see just some, some very funny tidbits of her book, um, you know, the planting method, it's the value of water, um, some tidbits. And she really, um, really had a, a passion for roses. And um, what we're trying to do is to make that come through in the rose garden without being a full rose garden. And that is a challenging, um, line to walk, and so this is how we're hoping to achieve that. Um, we will have roses in the garden beds, we will have them climbing on the fences and pergola, and we will have them near the exit of the garden. Um, so if we look back to this illustrative plan here, the um, blue circles are highlighting the location of the roses. So as you enter the garden, there'll be roses front and center um, on the upper level, on the lower level. Um, as you um, are gazing out towards the outside of the garden and Fox Creek beyond, your view will be framed in roses. And then these smaller circles around the perimeter are showing roses that will be up um, climbing on the pergolas and fences and walls. And um, the hope is that, my hope is that by highlighting the roses, by placing the roses in these really prominent positions, 
um, that really catch your eye, that um, you'll have the essence of roses, you'll have the fragrance of roses, which is especially important in a rose garden, um, and you'll get the scents of the roses um, without having a full rose garden, which will allow us to really extend the bloom time and the bloom season here at Castle Hill, which not only um, fits well with the current use of Castle Hill, but it in, um, really elongates the pollinator season um, for beneficial insects and butterflies that are passing through, um, allows us to be able to reduce our pesticide and herbicide use, and um, as well as our water use in the garden. So it's very important that we're able to um, highlight the roses, give a sense that this is the rose garden, and still be able to, to maintain our um, view and current use of, of how the gardens should fit into the larger landscape. Oh, oh, ah, okay, spring. So the central bed around the fountain, which if we think back to that historic photo was just a, a big tangle of roses, um, is going to be a bed that highlights um, seasonal color. So we will have seasonal tulip display um, around that bed highlighted by um, other masses of annuals in the garden beds and um, daffodils, alliums, um, everything that we can find to make a really um, dazzling spring color display. And using tulips in the center bed will allow us also to change the display and the colors and the theme each season, um, which really is how um, great gardens are designed, that each year it's something new and something exciting and, and something a little different and it really draws you back in. Um, this would be a big change because a rose garden in the early spring has really nothing going on. So um, taking that focal bed, the center fountain, and making it into a bulk display and during the season an annual display really allows us to have a, a wow moment as you come in the garden. Um, and we know from those historic photos that the rose bed um, for the cranes was a real wow moment, um, but that wouldn't be possible for us um, for a, a season long bloom. So tulips and bulbs it is. Then in the summer, we're looking for a bunch of um, refined, um, elegant plant combinations that fit with the um, romantic and kind of moody sense of the space. Um, and also our color schemes that are able to tie together the sun portion of the garden with the shade portion of the garden. So as you enter the garden, there will be um, predominantly pink beds going out in either direction. Those will um, change, be intermixed with blue that will then intermix with yellow. And as you go around the circle, um, the colors will be changing in the same locations. And hopefully that will give the garden a cohesiveness. Um, so even though the plants won't be the same, the tones and the colors will change in the same locations and create um, not only a sense of movement, but a tying together of the different locations. Um, and of course, we'll be incorporating roses into each of those sections um, to keep the theme of the rose garden together. And the summer section, um, I noticed in my slide that I've highlighted most of the pinks and blues, um, but the yellows will also be key. Yellows um, really stand out in the shade and they also um, really pop in the sun in that section where the garden is raised. Um, a lot of the blooms are, are almost exposed against the blue sky. And so having some strong colors there in the bright sun will balance with some of those more understated colors in the shade where they pop about the same way. Um, and so I think a lot of garden design is color science. And this is where I like to give my disclaimer. Um, 
Designing a planting design as complicated as the rose garden um, is a real challenge. And although you do the best you can and you put a lot of things on paper and an immense amount of thought has gone into this, um, during the season when you see things growing, some things just don't work out the way that you thought they would. Um, so I always see a first year garden um, as a bit of an experiment. Um, so we'll start really taking notes and assessing what's going on there. Um, in this first summer season, we're hoping to have the garden planted by uh, mid, if not the end of June. And um, that will give us ample opportunity to see how things grow in and to assess how they really look together as well as in that space. And then the last important season we'll be focusing on is the fall. Um, again, the cranes didn't really have much interest in the fall. Um, with a traditional rose garden, fall may have some sporadic rebloom, but would not be a season of major interest. Um, it's one of the most popular and most beautiful seasons here at Castle Hill. So we do see a real um, constant stream of people coming through the garden and we want people to have something to look at. We want the last butterflies, the last monarchs on their uh, travels before they head south to have something to nibble on. And um, extending the season just uh, makes sense in, in modern gardens. So um, again, we're trying to um, pick up on those same color schemes as um, the fall color comes in to the summer garden, the um, pattern of uh, color sequencing throughout the plants will change and hopefully it will be changing in, in similar ways, making that connection between the sunny side and the shady side. Um, and again, you just never know how, um, how the timing is going to work in these spaces. The uh, shade side tends to stay a little cooler. Um, the summer side, the sunny side stays obviously hotter. Um, but then when the frost comes, sometimes it, it stays a little more protected on that shady side and the opposite is true of the sunny side. So throughout this first season, we'll be really watching all of these microclimates and how each of the plants that I've specified and put in certain places is reacting. Um, and I anticipate um, a lot of moving and juggling um, and in the fall and probably again next spring. And um, that is the real fun of a garden design like this. Um, and being at a site like Castle Hill where we have a dedicated horticulture team, um, a great group of volunteers, and a lot of interest in um, the gardens here. So we are able to um, kind of play in that way, if you will. Um, and no discussion of the planting um, would be complete without what I call the unifiers. And so they are plants that I'm using um, in the sunny side and the shady side, um, several times repeating throughout the garden to um, once again uh, try and create this unified feeling um, between these really different sides of the garden. So um, in the top left corner, you see uh, hydrangea tough stuff. Um, which is a, a newer Proven Winners introduction, which I think is um, not only tough stuff, but actually fabulous. Um, it starts out um, in our garden here in the Rose Garden as sort of a, a bluer um, flat leaf and then fades to varying colors of pink and blue and purple um, until finally turning like a nice toasty flax color. Um, and that particular hydrangea works in both the shady spots and the sunny spots. So it's hard to find plants that you can use in both spots. Um, the center photo is really trying to show um, some silver foliage, which is another tool I use for blending. Um, silver foliage plants or white flowered plants um, are able to unify the different colors and, and bring those um, color changes together. A lot of times when you're trying to blend um, two yellows or two pinks, um, they're just not quite the same tones. And if they're right up against each other, um, 
you, you, your eye perceives that and you kind of, hmm. But if you have something white or silver in between those plants that blends them, um, those, those tones really even out and blend better. Um, the plant on the upper right is Amsonia hubrechtii. It was also the um, beautiful yellow golden plant in my fall slide. Um, so Amsonia has a blue flower in the spring, um, very early, earlier than most other things are going on. Then it uh, spends um, the middle of the season as a foliage plant is a great blender, a very feathery texture, um, and then it steps up again in the fall with a fabulous fall color. Um, and the slide down in the bottom is just more of my blending techniques. That is um, Ami Visnaga. It looks like a Queen Anne's lace, but it is a um, plant I'm starting from seed that doesn't um, spread. Um, or reseed the same way that Queen Anne's lace does. Um, and it's mixed there with Verbena benariensis. Um, another nice blender, purples are a really nice way to bring blues and yellows um, together. And so um, overall, I think the, the theme of the planting is to um, try to take this really romantic, really wonderful place that historically um, was a rose garden and uh, incorporate enough roses in the most prominent positions that um, it reads as a rose garden while using all these other um, techniques and plants to uh, unify the space and um, add seasonal interest. And lastly, we have to talk about the approach to the rose garden, which is also a really important element of this project. Um, so the slide on the upper left is uh, from the rose garden last summer, looking up towards the Italian garden. And um, what you see there is a weed fest. And that weed fest uh, stretched out in either direction for um, as much as you can really see. Um, it is a very unwelcoming way to enter the Rose Garden. Um, and so part of the rejuvenation of the space is to also work on the approach there um, to really welcome people into the garden. Um, and also provide a transition space. And uh, we do have some great historical descriptions of um, what the garden was like, how visitors experienced it. And um, what we do know is that the transition between that we're looking at there on the left from the Italian garden to the Rose Garden was very similar historically to the transition from the Great House down to the Italian garden. So um, whether it was Arthur Shercliffe or the Olmsted Brothers firm that designed these spaces to be like little wooded woodland dells that you would walk through um, and sort of let your body know that you were moving from one one space into another to transition into these different garden spaces. Um, so this is what we had currently. Um, and this is a slide of Arthur Shercliffe's um, showing what was there historically. And so you can see lots of big trees, um, lots of ferns and lower woodland plants down along the edge. Um, it looks nice and shady, so you would have a chance to sort of cool off and, and have a bit of shade, a bit of, a bit of respite as you transition um, from one space to the other. Um, and what you're not dodging is, um, you know, crazy poison ivy that, that's crawling in from the path, trying to brush your ankles as you walk by. Um, and so, as much as we look at um, what the inside of the garden will be, and that was the primary focus of the planting, um, we'll also be adding a border about 20 feet wide on either side of the step, so about 40 um, planted feet altogether um, to create a transition space as you come into the garden. And that is what we're hoping to do, again, we're um, getting some plants in even this week, hopefully. 
Um, the supply chain has been a bit disrupted, so we're still hoping for a planting um, completion date by sometime in mid to late June. And I hope that you will come and see the garden and enjoy the um, new planting design and take a bit of respite and let me know what you think about it. Thanks so much for joining us and have a great day.